The Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and Nonproliferation will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. Um, Please keep your video functions on at all time, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with remote committee proceedings of HRES 8, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. And recognizing that um, we probably will have votes called shortly um, you know, we'll continue the hearing as members kind of cycle in and out to, to record um, their votes on the floor. Um, I see that we have a quorum now and will now recognize myself for opening remarks. I want to thank Ranking Member Shabbat, the members of this subcommittee, our witnesses, and members of the public for joining today's hearing. Before we get started, I do want to take a moment to, to talk about what we've seen in a hate-filled um, mass shooting in Atlanta earlier this week, and to recognize the pain and trauma it's caused for many across the country, um, particularly in the, the Asian American Pacific Islander community. We've seen a dramatic rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans over the last year, crimes that tear at the very fabric of what makes our country so strong. And on Tuesday, eight lives were cut short because of this hate, including Peyo Fung, all Andre Michaels, Taeyun Jung Park, Julie Park, Xiao Jaitan, Peilanya, Ashley Yan, and others. Um, I know on this committee we will be taking a hard look at the region and certainly you know the Chinese Communist Party and what the Chinese Communist Party and their government is up to. But we also have to be careful about the language we use on, on this committee and understand that the Chinese Communist Party is not a reflection of, of the Chinese people and certainly is not a reflection of the many patriotic Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. So as we take a hard look and look at the, the challenges in the Indo-Pacific, the challenges um, in this great um, strategic power competition with, with China, let's be mindful of the language we use and mindful that we don't conflate what the Chinese Communist Party is doing with what patriotic Chinese and Asian Americans do every day in, in representing the values of the United States of America. With that, um, you know, we do have many challenges. I applaud the Biden administration for their recognition that the Indo-Pacific region may in fact be one of the, the, the most challenging regions in, in the coming decades. Um, and the pivot and emphasis on an Indo-Pacific strategy. You know, I appreciate the, the leaders um, summit that happened with the Quad and our allies in Japan, India and Australia last week, and the partnership and the commitment that our friends and allies through the Quad have focused on in terms of you know, creating regional security. I also applaud Secretary um, Blinken and Secretary Austin for making an early visit to our allies in Japan and Korea to strengthen that trilateral relationship as we deal with um, you know, what is still quite, quite a bit of a challenge in North Korea. We need a, a strengthened trilateral alliance to address those issues. I also appreciate Secretary Blinken you know, specifically um, calling out to China to say they have a responsibility in helping us get to the ultimate goal of a nuclear free peninsula um, on the Korean Peninsula. In addition, this subcommittee will spend um, quite a bit of time looking at the increased China Chinese aggression. Certainly we're seeing um, the anti-democratic um, moves that are taking place in Hong Kong with real concern. We see the human rights abuses that are taking place in Xinjiang um, province against the, the Uyghur population, as well as what's ha happened for years in Tibet. And increasingly, we're seeing um, Chinese aggression in the South China Sea um, and the East China Sea. And with increasing concerns, I know um, the ranking member Shabat and I have talked quite a bit about our concerns with um, Chinese aggression and increased aggression um, towards Taiwan and the importance that 
we understand um, that you know, the United States really does stand with Taiwan with our allies. And hence, we've introduced the Taiwan Fellowship Act, which will be a first step, but not a last step. Um, you know, these, this Chinese aggression, while we're going to have a history of competition with China, you know, we don't, you know, our, our desire is not to have a direct confrontation, but again, we have to have the rule of law and this committee will be taking a long look at building out that foundational strategy there. So with that, you know, we've got, you know, the committee also has jurisdiction over Afghanistan. We will be seeing, you know, May 1st is right around the corner, real challenges in, in how we approach Afghanistan. And we'll be working very closely with um, the rest of the, the, the full committee to address that and what that way forward looks like. So I expect us to have a, a very robust agenda um, on multiple fronts. You know, I look forward to doing things in a very bipartisan way. You know, the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat and I have worked pretty closely together over you know, my nine years on, on the subcommittee. And again, I look forward to having a great partnership with, the, with Mr. Shabbat. And with that, let me recognize my good friend from Ohio, our ranking member, Representative Steve Shabbat, for any opening comments that you may have. Thank you, uh, Chairman Barra. Um, I want to thank all the members from both sides of the aisle uh, as we convene the first hearing uh, of the Asia Pacific Central Asia and Nonproliferation Subcommittee of the 117th uh, Congress. I also want to thank our distinguished witnesses for their willingness uh, to provide their insight and thoughts on how the U.S. should continue engaging the Indo-Pacific region uh, during these challenging times. I've served on the full Foreign Affairs Committee for my entire uh, Congress, a quarter century now, including having chaired this very subcommittee back in 2013 and 2014. Um, and, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity uh, to serve as a ranking member. Of course, I'd prefer to be chair um, during what is arguably the most important uh, period uh, for US engagement in the Indo-Pacific uh, region in recent memory. Um, it's hard to overestimate uh, the or overstate the significance of this region, uh, which includes over half the world's population and more than a third of its global economy. Um, geographically, that is everything between the Caspian Sea and Hawaii, excluding uh, Iran and Russia, or of course, uh, in the jurisdiction of another subcommittee. Um, while it would be impossible to discuss all U.S. interests in such a vast and important region, the following are some of the highlights this committee should be focusing on, in my opinion. The Chinese Communist Party opposes an existential threat to the United States and to our allies. This is evident from their massive military buildup, their large-scale intellectual property theft, persistent cyber attacks, and their mercantilist uh, trade policies. It's also evident from their territorial aggression, concealment of the COVID-19 outbreak, in blatant disregard for human rights, the environment, and international treaties, and on and on. The, CC, C, the CCP wants regional and eventually global hegemony. They want a return to a world that is dominated by and revolves around the Middle Kingdom. The CCP is unwilling to operate by international norms. Unfortunately, given China's size and impact on the global economy, we cannot simply isolate them. Instead, we must work with our allies and partners to hold China to the same rules that everybody else follows and impose penalties when they do not. Uh, it's imperative that America rises to this challenge and our subcommittee has the mission to lead that effort. We must sustain and build our alliances and partnerships. I, belong, I have long favored a robust U.S. engagement in the Indo-Pacific region, which has demonstrated by the fact that I co-chair, along with some of my Democratic colleagues, six caucuses in the region, India, Taiwan, Philippines, Cambodia, Kazakhstan, and the Pacific Islands. While many of our allies and partners share our concerns with regard to China, they may not be willing to be resistant, even sometimes confrontational, as we might uh, uh, believe is the wise course of action at that time. Uh, we should strengthen and build upon the relationship with our quad partners, Japan, India, and Australia, and with our ASEAN partners, especially our allies, Singapore and Philippines. 
our relationship and deep ties with Taiwan, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, and Korea are also of paramount importance. And I must say, strategic ambiguity uh, relative to Taiwan and China is, in my opinion, absurd and dangerous. We ought to be crystal clear that if China attacks Taiwan, we will be there with Taiwan. That's the best way to keep China from miscalculating and starting a war. By cooperating with our allies and partners, the U.S. seeks to advance prosperity, human rights, and economic development, and the rule of law. We believe our model offers the best opportunity for the region. It is by working with those who share our values that we can help the region take full advantage of opportunities. Finally, the United States must make trade and investment throughout Asia a top priority. Countries throughout the region are hungry for U.S. investment, while U.S. businesses are eager for new markets and investment opportunities. By cultivating our economic ties, we will grow both our economy and the economies of our partners. Economic engagement is also an excellent means of fostering developing relationships in Central Asia, where partners like Kazakhstan are eager to engage. And improved economic partnerships are avenues to diversify our supply chains away from China and foster promising alternatives like Vietnam. I would like to close by introducing our vice ranking member, Congresswoman Young Kim from California. As a longtime staffer to former chairman Ed Royce, uh, she has worked on trade negotiations. She's taken a leadership role in the U.S.-Korea interparliamentary exchange and has a deep understanding of the Indo-Pacific region. Her experience and expertise will truly advance the work of this subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, I believe we have a great group of members uh, on our side uh, who bring experience, dedication, and commitment uh, to American values uh, to this subcommittee. Um, your members are okay, too. Um, we look forward to uh, working with you and our Democratic colleagues on this committee and addressing our nation's challenges in a bipartisan manner. And I, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for reaching out to me and discussing issues in advance of this hearing. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ranking Member Shabbat. And I, I should point out my um, vice chair and um, the congressman from Michigan, Andy Levin, who's got a very important um, resolution on the floor today, um, you know, condemning the actions that we're seeing in, in Burma. Um, and standing with the Burmese people against this coup. Um, with that, let me um, take a moment to introduce our witnesses. Uh, our first witness is Dr. Richard Haas, um, who's the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Haas comes to us with a widely respected record of innovative thinking on many of our biggest strategic challenges. Dr. Haas, we are grateful for your presence today. I think so, yeah. um, We're also joined by Ms. Um, Vijaj Royland. Um, he's a senior fellow for political and security affairs at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Ms. Rowland is one of the foremost experts on Chinese government strategy and on some of China's most consequential initiatives, like the Belt and Road Initiative. Ms. Rowland, thank you for joining us today as well. Um, and last and not, certainly not least is Mr. Randy Shriver, the chairman of the Project 2049 Institute and former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. Mr. Shriver brings a long record of service in government on national security challenges in the region, including civilian and military service. Mr. Shriver, we thank you for your service and for being with us today. I will now recognize each witness for five minutes. Without objection, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. I will first call on Dr. Haas for your testimony. Well, thank you, Chairman Barra, uh, Ranking Member Shabat. Uh, I just want to make clear that uh, I'm speaking here in my personal capacity, not for the institution I'm fortunate enough to be the president of. You've chosen a, a subject that is central, not just to this country, but really to the trajectory of, of this century. It covers an awful lot, geography and otherwise. I will focus, though, on China in my opening remarks even though I cover a lot else in my rather lengthy written statement. Uh, whatever it is we do in this part of the world, multilateralism will prove essential. We simply cannot deal adequately with China's power and China's reach unilaterally. 
We also cannot ask others in the region, our partners and allies, to choose between us. We need to understand that they will want to maintain a relationship with China at the same time they maintain relations with us, even though the specifics will obviously differ. We also need to understand the limits of what some of our partners or allies are prepared to do for them, which, with us when it comes to China. And here I mentioned Looks like um, we may have lost Dr. Haas. Um, is that correct from the, the tech side? Yes, sir. It looks like Dr. Haas is having some connectivity issues at the let's moment. Let's do this. Um, let's go ahead and move on to Ms. Roland and then you know, see if we can work on the technical issues with Dr. Haas. And you know, when he gets back, um, we'll let him do his full testimony. Ms. Roland, let's go and recognize you for your testimony. Thank you, sir. Chairman Barra, Ranking Man Member Shabbat, I'm deeply grateful and honored to be asked to share my thoughts with the subcommittee members today. As an analyst who devotes her days trying to understand the world through Beijing's eyes, I will focus my statement on where the Indo-Pacific region fits into the Chinese leadership's grand strategy. The Indo-Pacific region is where US and Chinese tectonic plates rub against each other. The term Indo-Pacific itself is very telling about the U.S. perspective. It is primarily a maritime geographic expanse that links the U.S. to a, an economically vibrant region and a crucial strategic space where many of its key military allies are located. An area the U.S. envisions as free, open, secure, and prosperous. There is no Indo-Pacific in Beijing's conception. The region is in fact included as part of China's periphery. Here too, the term itself is very telling about the Chinese perspective. China is at the center and at the top of a 360 degree peripheral zone that expands over both the continental and maritime domains. I don't know who's talking, but I have somebody else's talking over me and I got cut off and I still hear a woman's voice. Hi, hi doc, Dr. Haas. We lost you for a moment there because of technical difficulties. So we moved on to Dr. Roland to do her testimony. And then after she finishes, we'll come back to you, Dr. Haas, and let you do your full testimony if that works. We lost you for, great. Go ahead, doc, Dr. Roland. Thank you, sir. Left and clear are the exact geographic extent of this periphery and the kind of future the Chinese party states hopes to see for it. In order to get a better understanding of the Chinese leadership's objectives for the region, one needs to look back over a decade ago. In the immediate aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis, Chinese political elites felt that the American or Western decline had accelerated while China was on an unremitting upward trajectory. The 2011 Obama administration's announcement of the rebalance of its diplomatic and security focus to the Asia Pacific region was read in Beijing as a move meant to increase the pressure on China's immediate periphery, constrict its strategic space, and ultimately thwart its rise. In order to counter what was essentially perceived as an intensified phase of American containment, Chinese planners devised their own strategic rebalancing. The strategy embraced both land and sea, trying to stabilize East, uh, China's eastern maritime flank, constricting as much as possible U.S. access to the China seas while pressuring its allies, while at the same time consolidating China's power on its Western continental and maritime flanks. To expand China's influence and bolster its position over the region, Chinese planners decided to use economic power, China's strong point, as the main sign use, supplemented by the building of an increasingly dense network of both hard and soft infrastructures, transportation, energy, information and communication, infrastructure building, trade and financial agreements, and people-to-people -people exchanges. 
The strategic plan was announced at the end of 2013 under the name One Belt, One Road, which is now better known globally as the Belt and Road Initiative. Viewed for what it is, namely as a strategic plan, the BRI gives some indications about the Chinese leadership's intent. Geographically, BRI includes not only the Eurasian continent, Central, South, and Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and portions of Central and Eastern Europe, also known as the Silk Road Economic Belt, but also its adjacent waters, Arctic, South Pacific, Indian Oceans, and Mediterranean Sea, uh, also known as the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road and its three blue economic passages. The vision for the region's future is better explained by what it is not. It is not a one where the widespread respect and, uh, for an application of liberal democratic principles, such as freedom, individual rights, rule of law, transparency and accountability lead to greater openness, prosperity and security. At the same time, it is not where all the countries in China's greater periphery end up uh, having modeled themselves on the Chinese party state system or have become local appendages of the Chinese Communist Party. It is a vision where the multiplication of dependencies to China have created enough positive incentives and coercive leverage to ultimately compel regional countries to defer to Beijing's wishes and constrict their ability and willingness to defy and resist against China's power. This vision is not compatible with that of the United States. With this, I will yield. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Roland. And let's go back to Dr. Haas. Um, and Dr. Haas, if you want to start from the top of your testimony, because we lost you in there for a moment. Okay. Uh... Thank you, sir, and apologies for the uh, technological differences. I'm not at my normal base. Uh, but again, I want to thank you and the ranking member for uh, asking me here today. Just wanted to make clear I speak for myself and not for the organization I lead. Uh, your subject is obviously an important one. How Asia goes will in many ways determine how the 21st century uh, goes. I will focus, though, on, on China, even though there's a lot else to cover. I begin by pointing out that multilateralism is essential for all we do. We simply cannot deal adequately with China's power and reach unilaterally. That said, we, uh, we also cannot ask our partners and allies to choose, be to choose between us. Many of them will, for example, want to have economic ties with China, even though they will emphasize security ties with the United States. That said, we also need to understand that there are limits to what some of these partners and allies are prepared to do. And I'm happy to discuss, for example, the limits uh, that India might face. Whatever it is we do in the region, we need to beef up the economic dimension. To be blunt, we have sidelined ourselves. We have limited uh, our, our involvement and our influence. We should join the CPTPP. There is tremendous economic and strategic arguments for doing so, and I am also prepared to argue there could be climate reasons for doing so. As for China, it is anything but a supporter of the status quo. Xi Jinping's China is fundamentally different than the China of his predecessors. It is stronger, wealthier, more repressive, and more assertive. For all that, I do not do not think it is useful to use a Cold War framing for our relationship simply because China is so different than the Soviet Union was, and as a result, our response will need to be different. The priority for our foreign policy ought to be to shape China's behavior, particularly its external behavior. We should be imposing costs where we must and encouraging cooperation where we can. Toward that end, I believe, and despite what happened in the last 24 hours, a private, sustained, strategic dialogue is in the interests of the United States, not as a favor to China, but as a tool of American national security. Consistent with that, I believe regime change is beyond our ability to induce and in any event is not essential. Democracy and human rights consideration can and should be a part of our conversation with China. But we must accept and approach them with the realization that one, we have other priorities, and two, 
our ability to advance what we'd like to see in the realm of democracy and human rights in China is distinctly limited. When it comes to economics and technology, the United States should work with others uh, on selective technological restrictions with a scalpel <clears throat> rather than with a blunt instrument. But here, I would say decoupling from China is neither necessary nor is it possible. What we should do, though, and something Congress can play a large role in, is increase our supply chain resilience. We can do that through multiple sourcing, through stockpiling, and through domestic and joint production arrangements with our uh, partners and allies of selective items. We need to strengthen deterrence in the region. That obviously involves uh, our military presence, cooperation with groupings such as the uh, Quad. More than anything else, we must increase our ability to deter and prepare for and respond to any uh, Chinese coercion against uh, Taiwan. The stakes are enormous. Not to act would be, uh, I believe, a strategic error of the first order. I do believe we should move from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity in terms of the means of our policy. But then it is essential that we complement with this move of to strategic uh, clarity with strategic capability. We cannot allow a gap to persist between our commitments and our capabilities to, to act on them. Last, and for all this, I would say China policy begins not in the region, but it begins at home. We need to become more competitive with China, and this involves everything from increasing federal support for research and development, for basic research, the kind of thing companies cannot be expected to do on their own, for a wise immigration policy that attracts the most talented in the world to come and stay here, to build infrastructure, to improve our education. And second of all, we need to improve the, the reality as well as the appearance of our economic and political model. When we fail, we essentially let China off the hook. We basically lose the opportunity to show the advantages of a robust democracy and a robust market-oriented order. Therefore, their leaders feel no pressure from below. So if we want to succeed versus China, we need to become more competitive. But again, we need to pose a successful alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Haas. Um, let me now recognize um, Mr. Shriver for his testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Chavit, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate being included in this hearing and given the opportunity to express some thoughts on these important strategic matters. The Indo-Pacific is indeed where our country's future fortunes will largely be determined. And of course, our most significant strategic competitor, China, also resides in this region. Our interests in the Indo-Pacific are enduring, but the challenges are involving. The inheritance, I believe, from the previous administration is a strong one. The previous administration named the Indo-Pacific region as the priority theater, recognized the necessity of adopting a more effective competitive posture vis-a-vis -vis China, provided stronger and more visible direct support to Taiwan, nurtured and grew emerging partnerships with countries like India and Vietnam, gave unprecedented attention to the Pacific Islands, and began implementing policies to sustain and promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. All this despite the efforts of the Chinese Communist Party to actively undermine that order. The previous administration worked with Congress on a number of important initiatives on reforms to CFIUS, on the creation of the Development Finance Corporation, and investing in our joint force, making it more lethal and with PLA as a pacing element in mind. Of course, the previous administration benefited greatly itself from the work of its predecessor administ administration. And in many ways, the last administration's policy of a free and open Indo-Pacific was a natural successor to the Obama administration's pivot to Asia. And so I think we will likely see continuity, which in my opinion is a good thing. I'm encouraged by many of the statements and actions coming out of the Biden administration through its early days. Uh, like you, Mr. Chairman, I applaud the meeting of the Quad at the presidential level. I welcome the two plus two meetings with Japan and Korea and Secretary Austin's follow on trip to India and the continued recognition of China as a strategic competitor and the need to partner with like minded countries to preserve a free and open order is the appropriate vision. So given this good start, rather than criticize the new administration, I'd like to forward some thoughts and recommendations as there are still policies under review and positions yet to be revealed. 
First, I believe the Biden administration should continue to make competition with China its true priority in both word and deed, and it should be sufficiently resourced across all domains. Our alliances with Japan, South Korea, and Australia should be understood to be our greatest asymmetric advantage in this competition. Two, it should be the goal of the United States to maintain a military ed edge and to achieve a high degree of confidence that the U.S. would prevail in a range of known contingencies with China. This will necessitate wise implementation of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, and will also necessitate thoughtful approaches to how we might deploy ground-based precision fire capabilities that are now allowed after the withdrawal from the INF Treaty. Three, human rights and democracy promotion should be major pillars in our foreign policy, including in the Indo-Pacific, but we should also consider the geopolitical environment, and we must be deft enough to avoid pushing allies and partners further into China's camp. We should also be willing to raise the cost to the CCP for China's historic human rights abuses and not shy away from articulating a vision for a future for the Chinese people beyond authoritarian control and abuse. Four, the technology competition with China is very real and critical to the overall strategic competition. We should continue to develop tools to protect our technology ensure the integrity of our crit critical supply chains and reduce vulnerabilities, and work with partners and allies to achieve the same. But prevailing in the tech competition is most de dependent on out-innovating the other side. So we need our government to support entrepreneurship and innovation, and we should think creatively about where we are willing to bear risk. Five, the Quad should be made more meaningful on the defense and security side. This can be done through more complex exercises and more real-world cooperation. Uh, but we should also consider a flagship initiative, perhaps in the area of maritime domain awareness and maritime security across the region to make it meaningful. Six, I very much agree with uh, uh, Dr. Haas. We should pursue some type of flagship trade agreement. We need to be in the game as economic and trade and, and commerce are really the lifeblood of this region. Uh, seven, I believe engagement with Taiwan should be enhanced and U.S. support should be made more visible to further strengthen our deterrence against a PLA invasion. And I agree we should move away from strategic ambiguity and towards strategic clarity and tactical ambiguity. And finally, related to the DPRK, I believe the Biden administration should recreate the maximum pressure campaign directed at the DPRK, but resist providing the early and, and quick diplomatic off ramps before the sanctions come into full effect. Uh, I think this would also mean dealing with the DPRK as a de facto nuclear state and all that that entails with deterrence and counter nonproliferation uh, while still pursuing denuclearization. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shriver, um, for your testimony. I will now recognize members for five minutes each, and pursuant to House rules, all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. Because of the virtual format of this hearing, I will recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we will circle back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. I will start by recognizing myself for, for five minutes. Um, you know, each of you, you know, touched on uh, a, a number of consistent themes and, and Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask three questions, um, to one to, to each of you. Dr. Haas, you talked um, a bit about, or each of you talked about the importance of multilateral um, partnerships with uh, like-minded friends and, and, and allies in the region. You know, let's talk about the, the quad for a second. I'd love to get your perspective on, one, do we more formalize the quad into a more formal um, organization and your thought there, and how should we use the quad to then engage the ASEAN nations, you know, that obviously have a, a, a critical stake. So your thoughts there. Um, Ms. Rowland, um, I'd ask you a question. You know, obviously Taiwan and Chinese aggressions to Taiwan looms large on our committee's mind, and, and you know, we want to make sure they don't make a misstep. I'm glad, you know, my conversations with our friends in Japan and our allies in Japan, I'm glad that the Japanese raised it um, with Secretary Blinken and um, Austin. Your thoughts, you know, as we formulate a more strategic approach, working closely with our allies in Japan, I think it is the right strategy, but how are the Chinese going to view that closer alliance and their perspective 
and, and encounter that. And then Mr. Schreiber, you touched on the, the importance of maritime security and, and, and the like, and, and that is something that you know, we clearly are gonna, gonna focus on in, in this um, committee. We've seen you know, the, the, the Chinese Coast Guard you know, becoming much more aggressive, both in the South China Sea and the East China Sea with some of the, 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 the smaller ASEAN nations and so forth. So you know, as we're thinking through that strategy, um, how should we as well as the, the Biden administration adjust our US strategy in both the South China Sea and the East China Sea? So Dr. Haas, maybe if I toss it over to you. Well, thank you, sir. Let me just say two things. Uh, I think the quad is important, but to try to formalize it, I would argue would actually risk it. India in particular has a long tradition of strategic independence. And I believe we'll shy away from anything that smacks of an anti-Chinese alliance. I think more broadly, given the many types of challenges we face in the region, from North Korea to various China-related challenges to others, we have flexibility uh, to, ought to be our the hallmark of our approach to multilateralism. That for different challenges, we put together different groupings of, of partners and allies. And we, again, ought to mostly eschew uh, having anything that is uh, that is so formal. I think with the ASEAN countries, something I would recommend is, and it gets at Ms. Rowland's comments, which is uh, as part of a response to BRI, I would think that uh, a U.S. coordinated uh, and led infrastructure initiative could be something that was very attractive and infrastructure broadly defined. And just like now, we're getting more active in the region through the quad and things like vaccines. I think the provision of of public goods to the region and specific goods and services to various countries uh, ought to be increasingly a, a an example of uh, or priority for what it is we, we, we do in the region. Great, Ms. Rowland. Thank you, sir. Regarding Taiwan, I think uh, obviously the military deterrence is extremely important and strengthening the alliance system in Asia is one part of this uh, response that uh, the US can have. In addition to that, I would uh, submit that um, Taiwan is under enormous pressure also in the in influence of uh, operations realm. And there's things that I think the US and its allies could do to better defend and protect uh, the, uh, the cyberspace. Uh, and finally, I think the uh, uh, strengthening uh, Taiwan's international diplomatic space as well uh, within international institutions is something that the U.S. could do not just with its allies in Asia, but also uh, in Europe and in other in other places. I think these are three points that could uh, help with deterring uh, a further aggression of, of Taiwan. Thank you, Great. sir. And, and Mr. Schreiber. Uh, thank you. Maritime security begins with maritime domain awareness, and in in that regard, many of our partners need to develop more uh, capabilities. So capacity building is a big part of this. Um, we need countries to be able to see and sense, but also share. So networking is a is a part of this. So targets of interest can be held and passed between countries who share that overall vision for a free and open order, and then response, uh, having the platforms that can. Uh, operate in ways that that uh, challenge uh, vessels that are uh, operating in illegal, uh, expansive ways. Um, of course, the United States can operate across the full spectrum of seeing, sensing, sharing, and responding. Um, we need other countries to be able to move further on that spectrum through capacity building and, and partnerships. Thank you, and uh, appreciate all those perspectives and look forward to, to working with the three of you. Um, let me go ahead and um, recognize my good friend from Ohio, the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Secretary Schreiber, I'll go uh, with you first if I can. I'm one of the uh, co-chairs of the Congressional Taiwan Caucus. In fact, was one of the uh, original founders about two decades ago. And over the past two years, um, China has been increasingly uh, provocative and uh, trying to intimidate uh, Taiwan. That's nothing new, as I think we know, but they've been particularly outspoken recently. Uh, and Indo uh, PACOM Commander Admiral uh, Phil Davidson uh, testified uh, recently before the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he stated that he thought that China could invade Taiwan 
uh, within the next uh, six years. Um, what's your opinion with respect to both Taiwan's and the U.S. military's current uh, state of preparedness uh, in such an event? And uh, you, you mentioned in your statement uh, strategic ambiguity, as uh, uh, Mr. Haas did, and, and I agree with both of you that uh, uh, that, that is dangerous. Uh, and uh, could you elaborate on what would be a better policy with respect to strategic ambiguity? Thank you. The uh, the risks to Taiwan are growing because of Chinese investment in their in their uh, capability to operationalize the Taiwan contingency. Uh, but this situation is dynamic. Taiwan can do things to respond. The United States can do things to respond as well. So. I, I, I certainly noted Admiral Davidson's comments, um, but I, I don't know that we can be that precise in the timeline because, again, it's it's dynamic and it depends on how we respond to the growing PLA threat. And I do believe Taiwan is on the right track with its overall defense concept and the acquisition of some of the systems they're now investing in, uh, ISR capabilities, uh, for example, through uh, and unmanned systems, the coastal missile defenses. And I think our planners at Indo-PACOM and the Joint Staff are thinking about a, a scenario in much more realistic ways and, and thinking about how we might have to fight in, in, in ways that are putting us on the right track. Of course, the uh, comedian Will Rogers said, even if you're on the right track, you can get run over if you're not going fast enough. We do need a sense of urgency and a sense of purpose in these matters. And, and so we need to, to work on this uh, uh, very diligently. On strategic ambiguity, um, the formula that I like, and I, I applaud uh, Dr. Haas's contribution to this conversation, um, the formula I like is strategic clarity and tactical ambiguity. I think with respect to strategic clarity, we should, we should say it is in our interest for Taiwan to continue to survive and exist in its current form or better as a fellow democracy and a like-minded partner on so many regional and global issues. Uh, we should be able to say it is not in our interest for Taiwan to be controlled by the CCP in Beijing and brought under its authoritarian rule. We'll always have tactical ambiguity when it comes to response because response would be highly scenario dependent. And there are certainly a range of things we could do in a, in a contingency and, and there are a range of things the PLA might do. A blockade is different than an all out attack. So I think that that formula of clarity on the strategic side and ambiguity on the tactical side would strengthen our position. Thank you. Let me just follow up with you, Mr. Schreiber, at this point. Um, along with uh, my colleague, uh, Brad Sherman, we together co-chair the uh, India uh, caucus. And uh, the Indians have historically uh, had different threat uh, perceptions with respect to, to China. But in light of the uh, Galway Valley incident, uh, those perceptions are likely uh, changing somewhat. With that in mind, how, how should we expect India to contribute in the future uh, to our efforts to, to maintain regional stability and, and counter uh, Chinese aggression? Well, thank you. I, I am optimistic that our partnership with India will grow. Um, this is the work over several administrations. The Obama administration did a terrific job uh, building the defense relationship. I'd like to think the Trump administration contributed as well. But a lot of this is just being driven by the strategic landscape and the understanding uh, that, that China has ambitions on Indian territory. China is a, a partner of Pakistan and sees that as uh, a counterweight to, to India to try to divert their attention to their other uh, border. So we've been able to leverage that shared understanding of the threat to, to really enhance our cooperation. I agree that uh, we will probably not formalize anything in a bilateral alliance or a uh, even a multilateral grouping in a formal way. But in terms of real cooperation, we are seeing uh, very positive developments. And I think for us, if the Indians are able to secure uh, their territorial interests uh, with enough capability to deter China and to be able to operate in the Indian Ocean more effectively so that that critical part of the Indo-Pacific remains free and open and and smaller South Asian states are secure in their own sovereignty and with their interests. Uh, India can be a great partner to us in those in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired, but let me commend you and the committee staff on both sides for really putting together a tremendous panel of witnesses here this morning. And I yield back. Great. Thank you, um, Mr. Shabbat. Let me recognize my colleagues from California and Mr. Sherman for five minutes.
Mr. Rivera, congratulations on your first uh, hearing of the new Congress. Of course, your first hearing of the subcommittee, as I always remind people, was the first hearing of uh, of, of Congress uh, to focus on uh, on COVID. And I want to associate myself with your comments about uh, the AAPI community and understanding that uh, while we may criticize the, China, the uh, Communist Party of China, uh, we embrace uh, the AAPI community in our country. Um, we've uh, uh, sp spent uh, over the last several years half a billion dollars in aid to the government of Myanmar, Burma. That was clearly wrong given their treatment of the Rohingya. It is even more wrong to continue that um, uh, given the recent coup. Um, uh, I would hope that we would be, feel, uh, get ways to turn down the temperature, the naval temperature in the South China Sea. Uh, Mr. Haas and uh, Mr. Schreiber uh, uh, both pointed out that a critical part of this is our research on new technologies in the future. I need to point out that due to an accounting convenience rule that was established over 20 years ago, all American corporations are punished in their earnings per share, the most important thing to those corporations, when they spend money on research. And this uh, a pernicious accounting quirk is probably depressing the amount of research we're doing uh, uh, by 10, 20, maybe even 30%. Reversing it wouldn't cost us a penny. Um, the, uh, uh, as, as we see today, um, witnesses that come before us tend to do it virtually. And this means that we can have witnesses to our full committee or our, our subcommittee uh, wherever they happen to be, even if they uh, don't come to the United States for convenience reasons or because our State Department won't give them an appropriate visa. Uh, Dr. Haas, would it be uh, a good idea for us to have as a witness at a briefing or hearing the Foreign Minister of Taiwan? What message would that send? Well, again, you know, what it would send is another sign of normalization, if you will, between the United States and Taiwan. And I haven't thought hey. about that spe specific thing, but let me let me just make a larger point uh, 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 Dr. Haas, I've got limited time and I've got, got to move well, on. We, just, well, Dr. Haas, I've got limited time and I have to move on. Um, all of us on this committee and our witnesses live in a world where we get to think of rat the geopolitics and how the world is going to look uh, decades from now. Uh, our constituents live in the real world. They're not worried about the end of the world. They're worried about getting to the end of the month. Every dollar of trade deficit we run with China probably costs us on the order of 10,000 good jobs. Uh, so you can see how a trade deficit of hundreds uh, of billions of dollars affects our, our people every day. Does any witness have a suggestion, a, a uh, particular step or two we could take to reduce our trade deficit with China? I'm looking for, I, I don't, uh, uh, Dr. Haas, do you have? Well, again, I don't, do not think that reducing our trade deficit with China per se ought to be a goal of American foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Haas, that isn't responsive to the question. Thank, thank you. I'll go back to my constituents and tell them it shouldn't matter to them. Well, well, Congressman, if you're going to have, if you're going uh, uh, to have to ask me questions, time. I thought you would this want to let me answer. third time you've interrupted me. Dr. Haas, please. Um, uh, let's see. Um, China has made an enormous um uh, uh, investment in American debt. And yet the things that cause a currency to go down are running a trade deficit with the world and running a budget deficit fiscally. Uh, uh, Mr. Shriver, uh, from the Chinese perspective, do they think that they need to reduce the trade deficit or take any other steps to protect them from a, a precipitous decline in the value of the dollar? 
the Chinese understand that the trade deficit and the amount of debt they hold gives them a certain amount of leverage. Of course, it also binds them to us. In, oh, I, I, I disagree with you. If, in, if you bank, if you owe the bank money, they've got leverage over you because they can foreclose. If you owe the people money in international affairs, there's no foreclosure. If my bank couldn't foreclose on my house, my banker would be very nice to me. Uh, do you see? Uh, do they? Do you see them moving out of uh, U.S. debt? Well, I, I I don't because I think it's the best place for them to put the the surplus money that they have. Um, they're not investing solely to gain leverage over us. They're investing because they've got to do something with all that currency. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize my colleague from the great state of Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry. Five minutes of questioning. Hey, Dr. Barra, uh, congratulations on the hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Haas, I'm going to come to you in a minute and let you respond to my good friend from California. But I do have a question in the meantime for uh, for uh, Secretary Shriver. Uh, let me lead up to that for a moment. Uh, as the administration embarks on establishing the Indo-Pacific strategy, I hope to discuss perhaps one of the more pressing issues relating to the region, at least in my opinion, and that's the security of Taiwan. Uh, very shortly, I'll be introducing the Taiwan Plus Act. The bill would raise the value threshold for arms sales to Taiwan for the, before the president would have to notify Congress. So I want to give the president some flexibility uh, to do that and also cut down on the notification time the president would need to provide Congress for defense articles that exceed the values of the threshold for 30 to 15 days. Other than NATO, there are there are five other countries, the so-called NATO Plus Group, that enjoy these privileges. They are Australia, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand, and of course Israel. Um, we do have a time limit on it, and, and there is history regarding uh, the U U.S. Uh, Jordan Defense Cooperation Act, where we can uh, rescind that if, if if the situation changes. A sec Assistant Secretary, I want to just ask you. I know I'm hitting you with this cold, but your general thoughts regarding what I characterize as the Taiwan Plus Act and whether or not you believe the legislation could work in tandem with already existing efforts to ensure deterrence against China. And, and my interest is in, in, in deterrence. What are your thoughts? Well, thank you. As I, as I said in my statement, we do need a sense of urgency. And so uh, anything that gives greater flexibility to the U.S. administration to provide security assistance to shorten timelines I'm all for it. So I appreciate your initiative and, and would very much support the legislation and hope it's successful. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, doc, Dr. Haas, uh, I just feel like you've been kind of maligned there in your treatment a little bit. I want to yield you a little time to uh, to answer the, the question that was kind of posed for you and you weren't allowed to answer, if you, if you don't mind. No, thank you, sir. Let me just make two points on Taiwan, like, for example, meetings with their foreign minister. I would think that I would not emphasize such symbolic upgradings of ties with Taiwan. What I would focus on is the real meat of our relationship. What do we do to increasingly to increase our ability to deter, prepare for or defend against Chinese coercion or aggression? That, to me, ought to be what Congress focuses on, rather than things that simply take a stick and poke uh, China in the eye. There are ways we can functionally do things with Taiwan, but symbolic things that provoke what not to be fundamentally what we're about. With trade, which was the other question I was asked, again, balances don't matter. What I care about is China doing anything to unfairly advantage their exports to us without order to stop, and our American firms having the access they need to China's market. And the only thing that should hold us back there is our need to be selective on what technologies we allow to go there. All right. I, I appreciate your response. And, and I understand where your, your uh, opinion regarding uh, the symbolic gesture, so to speak, and I'm not saying it's not one to a certain extent. Look, I, I would like to get much tougher on China uh, completely. I, I would like, if you know anything about me, I mean, I think we ought to just recognize full relations with Taiwan and and uh, and, and consider them the, the true China. But uh, so maybe that's a little too provocative for some people, but I think it's sooner or later, we're going to have to fish or cut bait with uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And, and all we're doing is fiddling around the edges. So I understand. Uh, your perspective, but I do want to move forward. 
on kind of both avenues. And I think that that's a, I think that this is at least something in a bipartisan way that signals that we want to pull China or correction Taiwan a little closer. I mean, um, going back to the secretary, um, what do you think if you, if you know, not, look, I know this is a hard question, but how do you think uh, the Taiwan plus act would be received by the Chinese communist party and specifically the general secretary? I mean, is, is, is it going to be seen as a, as a kind of a hollow gesture because they seem to blow everything out of proportion. Um, but, but they seem to have some effect at doing that. And, and chill every effort on our part to stand with our allies. Well, that's certainly one of the problem. They, they, they object to virtually everything, which then makes it hard to sort of disaggregate and, and determine which things they really care about and which they care less about. Uh, but I would think, you know, for the more sophisticated analysts on the, on the Chinese side and the PLA side, they would see your initiative for what it is, a, a way to strengthen security cooperation, uh, defense and military ties, and enhance uh, Taiwan's uh, deterrence uh, capabilities and posture. So I, I think this would uh, be received ne negatively, but certainly that's not the metric for whether or not we do something if, if China doesn't like it. Uh, in fact, in some cases, it's the metric for why we should. And in, in this case, I think we, we should uh, very much follow the, the course you're suggesting. Yeah, and I appreciate your input and I would agree with much of your sentiments, especially when it comes to the Communist Chinese Party, the fact that they oppose it is a signal to me that we're on the right track. But uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back any balance of the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize my colleague from Nevada, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the witnesses for being here today. I'd like to ask Dr. Haas some, some more about Burma. You know, the situation in Burma is just continuing to escalate every day. And even after rebukes from the global community, the violent reaction by the military doesn't seem to show any signs of stopping. Uh, ASEAN has been kind of lukewarm at best in this whole process. And we've seen some member countries actually begin diplomatic relations with the new military government. I wonder what you think is our best course of action, working with some of our allies to try to end the conflict. And if you think it's realistic to believe that the, the um, NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi will come back and, or is this push for democracy bigger than just the cult of her personality? Well, Congresswoman, uh, the push is bigger than the cult of any individual. The problem is the ability of those in power now to resist the kinds of pressures you're talking about. And they are gradually beginning to expand their ties with the outside world, uh, some of the ASEAN countries and China. To me, it's a frustrating classic textbook case of the difficulty of translating our principles into policy and into outcomes that we want. So I think we continue to advocate for what we want, but uh, look, whether it's China, Russia, uh, Turkey, Myanmar, whatever, I think what we're seeing is in some ways the limits to America's ability to influence the internal trajectories of other countries. So yes, we should still advocate for it. Yes, we should introduce sanctions where we think it should do some good, but I think we also have to be re realistic about the limits to our, to our influence. Well, thank you. Isn't that then conceding to China's point that we should stay out of the issues of Taiwan or Tibet or um, other human rights abuses, Hong Kong? No, not, not none whatsoever. Hong Kong, China violated its international undertakings. We ought to be clear rhetorically, but also we ought to look, working with the British and others, look for financial penalties. <clears throat> with Taiwan, we have all sorts of obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act. We don't have to accept Chinese, uh, the Chinese position on, on Taiwan or on the Uyghurs or anything else. All I'm saying is we have to calibrate our response against two things. We've got other priorities in American foreign policy, not just these. And I think at times we have to understand there are limits to how far we can succeed when we try to pressure other countries to change their internal workings. This is not new. This was a recurring challenge, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union during, during the Cold War. And I think this is this will always be part of our foreign policy uh, experience. 
Thank you. I, uh, Ms. Roland, I would ask you to comment on our relations with China. What are some of the things where we can come together, even though we see them as our most serious competitor? And certainly the talks didn't start off too well with Secretary Blinken over the week, over this past week. Thank you, ma'am. I think the uh, possibilities for corporations are, are really um, very small. Uh, nowadays, uh, unfortunately, you know, even if uh, many people are still hoping that we can work on global issues and problems like pandemic and climate change, I think fundamentally the interests of both countries are not converging. Um, it is important to continue to maintain communication channels, obviously, but I think we should uh, lower our expectations about the uh, positive outcomes. Uh, that we could get from Beijing. Do you think strengthening our ties with Japan and Korea will help in any way, or is that just? Uh... I would also broaden the scope and not just focus on East Asia per se. I know that this is where American allies are strong and uh, um, very much in close contact with uh, with China. But I would also um, urge. Uh, the U.S. to think about a broader uh, coalition of like-minded countries that extend beyond East Asia, uh, because this is a the, the challenges that China poses are not just uh, to the U.S. Uh, and they're not just to Taiwan. Uh, it's a broader uh, challenge that. Uh, expands to many different domains: um, economic, technological human rights, but also in terms of norms. So it's it's a very complex task uh, because it's so multidimensional. And therefore the US should not, should, it's, it's impossible I think to focus on just one segment of it. It has to be much broader in terms of domains and in terms of allies and partners that you can find to, uh, to reduce that challenge. We certainly see Chinese uh economic influence with the Belt and Road building a port in Peru, for example. It's every, everywhere. That's exactly right. That's one good example. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. Thank you. Let me recognize my colleague from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a pretty simple question, um, and because I, I think words are cheap on a lot of this stuff. It doesn't seem that we do a whole lot. A lot of times, and that's not a partisan thing. That's just my assumption of all this. Um, how, well, how should the U.S. respond to China's Belt and Road Initiative? It seems that's one of the most egregious things they do outside of human rights violations. They get their claws into these little countries and then they own them. But what can we do to respond to it? And that's for the whole panel. Well, I can say one thing, and by the way, the Council on Foreign Relations has a task force coming out on the, what should be the response next week, an entire comprehensive study of it. But it involves everything from working with locals, I think, on an infrastructure fund. It means new trade initiatives, joining uh, CPTPP. Uh, it, it means looking at our foreign aid, who gets it, how we use it. Uh, it looks, it look, means looking at our immigration policy, in some cases, our exchanges. Bottom line is we've got to compete. And Congressman, I think if we compete with China, uh, I'm not worried so much about the reach of Belt and Road. I think, you know, historically, we've got a lot more to offer uh, when it comes to technology, when it comes to investment, when it comes to trade. We just got to get out on the dance floor. Okay. And we're, not doing, we're not doing that right now? Not nearly enough, sir. Okay. Do y'all have, does the Council on Foreign Relations have any parameters of how much money we should be putting into these countries? Uh, I will get you the report uh, presently. How's that? All right. Make sure Will Strother in my office needs to get that if you can. Yes, sir. Okay. Any of the others? If I may, sir, uh, I've been looking at the Belt and Road for the past seven years myself, and uh, I think really what we need to understand, it's like Belt and Road is not just about infrastructure building. It's the focus of it, and it's where the attention went because of this trillion dollar number attached to it. 
and because of some of the uh, examples like in Sri Lanka where, where Chinese entities have seized um, assets um, and, and the port of Hambantota, for example. I think beyond infrastructure, there is also a lot of soft infrastructures that are being built by China, uh, including uh, through um, um, currency swap agreements, uh, financial integration agreements, um, ed agreements in higher education and technology, industrial standards. Um, you need to think about BRI as China's response to American strategy, not the other way around. Uh, and yes, we need to provide alternatives because the way China is doing business through Belt and Road um, is antinomic to the way um, uh, international standards are promoted. There's no transparency. There's no respect for labor rights. There's no respect for the local populations or environmental sustainability. So yes, it is important to provide alternatives to these countries, but also to go beyond the kind of narrow view that this is about infrastructure building. This is about creating a world uh, where China is the predominant power in the region through a wide array of networks and um, knitting together the region around China. Uh, so in, in that way, I think this is why we need to be more multidimensional in the way we address it. All right, thank you. Recently, uh, Kazakhstan has pushed back against Russia and even against Chinese Belt and Road diplomacy. What are some of the ways the U.S. can build a strong relationship with the Nur Sultan, the capital, and muscle out Moscow and Beijing? If I may, I think uh, many of these countries want to actually uh, have it both ways. And uh, having China coming in is a good leverage for many of them to say, look, we, uh, we would like to engage with other countries so that they can then choose what's best for themselves. This is, this, is, um, this is where I think it's not just true for, for Kazakhstan, it's true for many of, of the other regions in the South, uh, the South Pacific, for example, in Southeast Asia as well, um, in the South Caucasus. Um, you know, these countries want to uh, develop themselves first and foremost. <laughs> Um, and so having uh, different great powers that are paying attention to them, it's a good way to leverage one against the other and then choose what the best uh, option for themselves in the end. Okay. Anybody else on that? Um, one final thing. Um, is there going to be a way that we could drive a wedge between the Kazakhs and the Chinese um, due to the Chinese persecution of the Uyghurs? If I spent I may, a lot of sorry, go ahead, Wendy. Oh, I, I was going to say, I spent a lot of time uh, in the region talking about this very issue uh, when I was in government, and it, it'll be a slog. I mean, the, the uh, governments themselves are very deferential for reasons that we can probably uh, figure out the proximity to China, the importance of the economic relationship, and so on and so forth. But in many cases, civil society, to the extent it, it exists in these places, that's where the concern is really growing. You know, it's interesting. They will, uh, the governments will complain to the U.S. about moving our embassy to Jerusalem, but not a peep about the Uyghurs or the Rohingya, which is much more closer to home. But if you talk to civil society in these countries, they do have genuine concern about how their fellow Muslims are being treated. Great. The gentleman's time's expired. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Let me go ahead and recognize um, my colleague, the, the vice chair of the subcommittee, Mr. Levin from Michigan. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to pick up right on your important opening remarks. Uh, we're having this hearing three days after shootings in Atlanta that killed eight people, six of whom were Asian women. Hate crimes against Asian Americans in major cities skyrocketed last year by almost 150%, and that's just the ones that were reported. Obviously, this is a hearing about foreign policy, not hate crimes in the US, but I don't think we can separate the two completely. 
We talk a lot here about foreign policy challenges as they relate to China, and we should. I myself often talk about the Chinese government's human rights abuses in Tibet, Xinjiang, and elsewhere. I witnessed the government's crackdown on dissent in Chengdu during the Tiananmen massacre in June 1989 firsthand. I have no illusions about the CCP. As we hold the government accountable, though, I think we need to keep in mind the impact our words can have on people. Donald Trump's racist references to the coronavirus absolutely deserve blame for the spikes in attacks. Stop AAPI Hate's national report included examples of verbal attacks that parroted his words specifically. But discrimination against Asians didn't start with him. In fact, one of our country's first immigration laws was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. I say all this not to suggest that we shouldn't tackle issues related to China or any Asian government. We should, and indeed, we must. But I think we need to take care when we talk about this to avoid language that stigmatizes people. I know I'll be challenging myself to do more to stop AAPI hate. So let me get to my first question uh, and on this topic. I wanna ask Mr. Haas, how might we do a better job of separating our criticisms of CCP, CCP policies from the Chinese people and their aspirations? And how does racist language from American political leaders hurt America's standing in the region? Uh Congressman, let me just sort of say, I think what you've raised is, is, is troubling and important. You know, our founders set out to form a more perfect union, and clearly two and a half centuries later, we're not quite there. And your, your point is to some of the most recent uh, egregious examples. But I think it's important per, in part to calm down some of the public language. Uh, I wasn't a big fan, shall we say, to say the least. Uh, I thought it was just dead wrong to talk about things about the China virus. Uh, yes, it uh, almost certainly began in China. The origins are unknown. But when it came to the United States, how we responded to it was on us. And scapegoating, it seems to me, is, is never a wise public uh, policy. And the scale of the cost in the United States, that wasn't on China. That was on, on us and what we, we, we failed to do. So I would just say more broadly, though, uh, as I said, we, we should be pointing out the flaws in China. We should be putting forward a more positive image of ourselves. But we've got we've to gotta have a private dialogue with them. This is the most important bilateral relationship of this era. It will, it will have enormous impact on history and on ourselves. Exactly. So, as a result, right, me, we want, with my limited time, let me get to one more question. Um, and. Uh, this, I want to sort of pull together some of this dialogue we've been having about China, the Belt and, and Road, and U.S., how to deal with it. I think we need to, uh, and some of you referred to this, I think we need to uh, not just be reactive, but deal with the world as it is in a bold, American, innovative, creative way that uh, provides leadership. So, for example, might it be an effective thing? And we also need in dealing with China to have an industrial policy in this country. So might it be uh, a, an effective thing to deal with China to have for the United States to lead a hemispheric climate change initiative to help all the countries, especially the poorer countries in the region, develop wind, offshore wind, solar, uh, energy storage on a large scale where we could you know, have a lot of in U.S. industrial participation, but also work with them to develop their own capacity uh, in a way that's truly generous, but truly multilateral and regional. In a, in, and that's not defensive because it deals with the greatest problem of our time. So, Mr. House, I'll start with you. And if others, we have time, others can jump in. Uh, we're in violent agreement. Uh, we ought to be offering technology. Sustainable development ought to be something that we take the lead in. A lot of BRI is still very heavily oriented towards coal. So we ought to be looking at, just like we do in the sphere of uh, pharmaceuticals, where can we license or make available technologies that would help other people grow and grow in a sustainable way? That's exactly the sort of response we ought to have to BRI. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chair, I think my time has expired. I, I don't see you.
It does look like your time's expired, Mr. Levin. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> let me go ahead and recognize my colleague from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for doing such a great job. Uh, again, compliments to these terrific witnesses for uh, discussing this very significant national security challenge uh, and the rise of China and how we respond to it. And let me pick up where uh, my friend and colleague from Michigan was left off, and I appreciate his his comments about being careful and making distinctions between the CCP and the people of China. I think it was an excellent point and I appreciate the sentiments, um, uh, the very decent sentiments of my, of, of my friend. I do want to just though point out that uh, moral clarity is required in this discussion and uh, sharp criticism of the CCP is not racist. It is about policy and it is about foreign policy. And I think clarity is really important. And so Ms. Shriver, yesterday during the, the meeting in Alaska, the Chinese delegation attempted to paint the United States as, as hypocritical for our directly raising a number of international concerns regarding the CCP. And while I know the United States has gone through a very rough year and we have our own issues, I did want to ask a series of, of questions that may highlight the differences, uh, the, the moral differences between the United States and China. Um, is the United States currently participating in an ethnic cleansing of its own population in state-run internment camps? Yes or no? No. Uh, is the United States uh, currently stealing intellectual property from companies doing business here and then giving that technology to our military? Yes or no? Certainly not government, federal government sponsored. Is the United States jailing those speaking out in favor of democracy and human rights? Yes or no? No. No, and, and thank you. And I wanna highlight these differences uh, for when we're talking about our way forward in the Indo-Pacific. We must be clear to our partners and allies, uh, and, and this must be a moral clarity of who China is and what behavior they engage in and uh, and the moral superiority, frankly, of the the western uh, the Western approach and the, the the approach of an open, free, and democratic society versus a closed communist um, police state that is the CCP. And I do not believe that that is racist rhetoric. that is that is a rhetoric about um, the challenges that we confront, and it's it's about being clear-eyed. let Let me um, ask uh, Mr. Mr. Ha, uh, uh, Mr. Haas, a question about uh, emerging technologies, 5G, 6G, and um, uh, protecting American technology. Um, the U.S.-China uh, Economic Security Review Commission is a great resource for the Congress uh, and for policymakers. And um, in speaking to some of these just outstanding experts on our, uh, on our complicated relationship with China, uh, it's been said that um, uh, we need to be putting uh, higher walls around fewer things, um, and especially when, when it comes to protecting American technology uh, in the face of decoupling. How can Congress partner with industry in the United States and in allied and partner countries to protect uh, necessary critical technologies? Uh, that's exactly right, by the way, Congressman. We higher walls around fewer things, scalpel, not, not, not sledgehammer. Uh, I think we ought to, the first thing is to identify where what those what those technologies are what are the things most likely to be drivers and make a difference in the commercial economy in the intelligence business in the military and those are the ones we think have to think about funding not just domestically but one of the things congress do could also is facilitate joint projects with the partners and allies that we that we spent so much time talking about in the course of this uh in the course of this hearing um, let me uh, quickly uh, talk about Belt and Road and countering Belt and Road, follow up on uh, Mr. Burchett's uh, line of questioning to any of our witnesses. Um, uh, how can we more effectively use the Development Finance Corporation and the Export Import Bank in, in countering Belt and Road? Sir, I think this is a very important tool that uh, is uh, available to the, to the U.S. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't believe necessarily that what the Americans have to offer is necessarily what the developing world wants because those those loans and grants come with condition, political conditionalities. 
that many of those countries don't want to accept in terms of transparency, rule of law, et cetera. And this is where the Chinese way of doing things, uh, the, Ch the, the, the Chinese government's way of doing things is a challenge because they do not offer any po political conditionality to those countries in terms of democratization or anything else. So this is really the crux of the matter because there are two offers there that are very different and provide the alternative is very important. At the same time, I think there's other ways in addition to money and funding uh, that can be helpful like skills um, and some sort of expertise in demonstrating that perhaps uh, Chinese projects are not going to be sustainable in the long run. I think this is also an efficient way of coping with uh, BRI. Thank you, Dr. Barber. Obviously, my time has expired. I hope someone uh, will, on the panel will ask about um, Taiwan accession to the United Nations as a deterrent to PRC aggression. And uh, I obviously can't ask that question now, but I invite someone else to, and I yield back. Great. Thanks so Thank much. Let me now recognize my colleague from Pennsylvania, Ms. Houlihan, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you. I didn't expect to be called. I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, my first question is for Mr. Haas, which has to do with the Council of Foreign Relations and their recent report on the role of women uh, in terrorism. And it said that the U.S. Uh, pretty traditionally neglects the roles that women play in violent extremism. And so I was glad personally to include an amendment or a provision in the FDA uh, in the NDAA uh, that asked the DOD to assess this issue and how to better incorporate women into our efforts to uh, counter violent extremism. I was wondering if you have any ideas on how we might be doing that more effectively in the Indo-Pacific specifically. The short answer, Congresswoman, I don't, I don't, uh, I know we published it. I'm not an expert on it, but I will make sure we follow up with you. I would very much appreciate that because I think that this is, you know, obviously we are 51% of the population. And I think that this is something that needs the attention of all of us when we're talking about security around the world. Um, my next question is for, for you and for everyone. Um, in 2020, the Global Terrorism Index ranked Pakistan, India, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Myanmar as the top 25 uh, countries impacted by terrorism. Uh, the Asia Pacific area was one of only three regions, uh, re regions that experienced a rise in terrorism in 2019. I was wondering what you attribute that rise in terrorism to specifically in the Asian Pacific region. And can you describe the US counterterrorism efforts that the US has in that region to try to combat that trend? Mr. Haas, I, I, if, I, if oh. we could maybe start with you. Yeah, I, I was going to defer to to Randy Schreiber, who's more okay. of a well, uh, an expert. I would just say in 30 seconds, and I'll defer to him. He's a real expert. Is that in many of these cases the problem is not strong governments but weak governments, a place like uh, who are either unable or unwilling to make the commitments to police what goes on within their their own territory. Pakistan being the poster child of that, and one of the the for us what we have to think about is not necessarily fighting the problem for them but how we can help build capacity in these countries so they can do a better job to meet their domestic and international obligations. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think you, you really have to disaggregate and look at each country and the, the, the challenges they face in the Philippines. Uh, in the case of recapturing Marawi City, it was not only capacity building, for the armed forces of the Philippines, but it was direct enabling support. We we were in the fight in a in a uh, a way that uh, became enabling for the AFP to retake the city. In other cases, it's it's assistance with reintegration of uh, foreign fighters. Um, so you you really have to understand the specifics of of the challenges a, a particular country may face. But it's certainly a focus for our uh, special operations. Um, uh, command and it's uh, a focus of, of Indo-Pacific Command as well to be able to get to that level of granularity and, and assist the countries with with the particular challenges they have. Thank you. This, I, my next question is actually for you, Mr. Shriver, as well. Uh, Secretary Austin has embarked on a global force posture review uh, while also la launching a China task force to better align our military resources and to better address China's evolving military capabilities. 
Uh, if you were conducting those reviews now, what realignment would you consider of basing agreements as well as diplomatic and, and economic resources? Well, I wish them success in these efforts. It's very important. Uh, I, I think if you look at the potential China fight, uh, and not that we want to have that fight, but that in order to deter them, we need to be able to have a high confidence that we, we would prevail. Uh, it's, it's about dealing with their ballistic and cruise missiles and the fact that they can hold our forward deployed forces at risk. So their so-called A2 AD strategy. So I think uh, thinking about dispersal, diversification, uh, survivability of, and, and a protracted ability to continue to operate in that environment are the keys. I think the Pacific Deterrence Initiative is a great start. It gives uh, some new tools to be able to forward deploy uh, ammunition, logistics support. But ultimately, dispersal and access, uh, that means having partner countries willing to uh, participate in, in particular ways, give us the access when we need it. And so that's that's really on our diplomats, too, to help develop those relationships. So I'm, I'm encouraged with the direction that the Biden administration is taking. There's there's quite a bit of details to be to be worked through, though. And I only have 10 more seconds uh, left, so and I'll put, submit the rest of my questions for the record. But for Mr. Haas, I very much would like to have a continuing conversation on the role of women and security uh, in the region. And thank you. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Hulant. Let me go ahead and recognize my colleague from Tennessee, Dr. Green, for five minutes of questioning. Self muted here. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Ranking Member, uh, for your holding of this committee today. I want to thank our witnesses for testifying before us today. Dr. Haas, let me say your book, uh, World in Disarray, is one of my favorites, and I'd suggest every member of this committee should read that book. While I'm Ranking Member on Western Hemisphere, the Chinese Communist Party makes this subcommittee the most important one in Congress. The United States and the Chinese leadership, note I didn't say Chinese people, the US and the Chinese leadership have contrasting values and incompatible goals. We certainly don't share the same vision for the Indo-Pacific. The United States seeks to advance the fairness for all values of the rules-based international order, in a word, freedom. The CCP seeks political power and regional dependence on Beijing not unlike previous Chinese emperors, in a word, they want authoritarian control and subservience to their concept of world order. According to a report by the RAND Corporation, nations in the Indo-Pacific believe the United States has more diplomatic and military influence than China. However, they believe China has more economic influence, and China uses this leverage to undermine the United States diplomatically and militarily. Many analysis analysts suggest the world is at risk of losing the freedom to navigate the region. This is preventable. President Biden should continue efforts to negotiate free trade agreements with our allies. The president should also continue the previous administration's efforts to counter the Belt and Road Initiative, such as the Trilateral Partnership for Infrastructure Investment. Additionally, we need to encourage American companies to move their supply chains out of China. That's why I introduced the Bring American Companies Home Act to offset the moving costs for American companies that reshore their supply chains from China. We must not neglect the economic sphere when it comes to our allies in the Indo-Pacific. We must show them that the international rule-based order is, is a better alternative to the Chinese Communist Party's Middle Kingdom tributary system. China's strategy has two critical components. First, to advance its technologies and hence their sharp power through China 2025. And second, to disrupt our allies and partnerships through their Belt and Road Initiative. Our strategy should, as the Atlantic Council suggests, focus on three long-term objectives. First, strengthen. We must strengthen relationships with our allies and partners in the rules-based international order by A, prohibiting Chinese engagement in economic sectors vital to our national security, B, developing new military capabilities to maintain a favorable balance of power, and C, reasserting influence on multilateral institutions and even creating new ones when necessary. Second, we have to defend, defend against Chinese aggress aggressive behavior and impose costs for those violations. That means establishing offsetting measures, to use the council's word, collectively re uh, resisting coercion by decreasing dependence for ourselves and our allies and partners. And in order to defend, we must counter Chinese IP theft and their influence operations. 
third and final, we need to engage China. Now, it may sound odd coming from someone who most would call a China hawk, but our ultimate goal here should be to cooperate with China where we can, only where we can. Things like public health and the environment are two great areas where we can work together and communicate and, and advance our relationship so that we can incorporate China into the rules-based order. Dr. Haas, do you mind elaborating on the differences between Xi Jinping and his predecessors and how that may impact or provide enlightenment, so to speak, to our strategy? Yes, sir. Uh, the predecessors to Xi Jinping, most importantly, Deng Chun Xiaoping, uh, were much more cautious in their external behavior and their foreign policy, basically said China needs a stable periphery in order to do the social, political, and economic development at home. Uh, and it's not surprising that the best period of U.S.-Chinese relations in the modern era was during that period. What we now have with Xi Jinping is someone who's very different, basically is acting as if China's time has arrived, sees the United States as weak and, and divided, and essentially is pressing on every front. We see it with India, we see it in the South China Sea, we see it with Taiwan, we see it with Japan, we see China not meeting its international obligations on trade, we see it not meeting its international obligations on, on Hong Kong. We see what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghurs. This is a very different China that basically is no longer, to use the Chinese expression, hiding and biding its time. But China is basically saying we're arrived and we're going to act differently now. Would you say they're in the phase three of uh, an insurgency, so to speak? That direct confrontation phase? Uh, no, but I think they're acting in ways say vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, that we have to be extraordinarily mindful of. And what we have to do is basically say, how do we now push back selectively to make sure that whatever their goals are, where you began your intervention, whatever their goals are, they decide they cannot pursue them successfully. That's what we need to get to. Agreed. Thank you. My time's expired. Appreciate y'all being here today. Chairman, I yield. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize my colleague from North Carolina, um, Ms. Manning, and welcome to the subcommittee. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for putting together this excellent panel. Dr. Haas, I was particularly interested in your statement that the U.S. needs to focus on certain areas where we need to enhance our own ability to be competitive. You mentioned, for example, that we need to reform our immigration policies to attract the best and the brightest. We're currently considering immigration reform that would increase the number of H-1B visa holders and exempt from CAPS uh, people with PhDs in the STEM field. Is this the kind of reform you believe we need? Would we be better off if we extended that exemption to people with master's degrees or even bachelor's degrees in the STEM areas? Uh, directionally, it's 100% right. If you look at the Fortune 200, 500, a shocking percentage of the people are either immigrants or the first generation after immigrants. This is real talent. China doesn't have an immigration policy of people coming in. This is one of our structural advantages if we will only allow it to be. Thank you. You also referenced the importance of ensuring that we have supply chain, supply chain resilience, diversification of sources, and stockpiling of domestic production. We saw during this pandemic that we had a dramatic shortage of PPEs when our supplies from China were cut off. In my own district, we have manufacturing companies that were told by the prior administration to ramp up and produce those PPEs, and then they were left with warehouses full of PPEs when they were undercut by lower cost PPEs from China when the supply chains opened back up. Do we need to maintain domestic supplies in our own country in anticipation of future disruptions? Well, you raise a good question and there is a risk we'll be asking companies to take if we go ahead with stockpiling. I would say in certain areas, that's a price worth paying. We would say as part of long-term public security, we're going to make certain investments in, in certain areas. What we'll probably want to do is, given the expiration dates of certain things, is come up also with the way of getting those things out of stockpiles while they're still uh, valid. And it's again, it's something that doesn't just have to be domestic. We could use the USMCA with Canada and Mexico. We could do certain things with some of the countries that fall under the purview of, of this committee. They're much more likely to work with us if there's also an upside for them in the process. Uh, I also have a high-tech manufacturer of microchips in my district who have said that we will see the loss of our microchip industry to China if we don't protect domestic supply chains in that area as well. 
What are your thoughts on ensuring domestic microchip industry? Well, again, I defer to the other two to some extent, but I would say, look, so much of it is in Taiwan. One, it's a powerful argument for why Taiwan is so important that its security is so important. But also, I think this is a legitimate subject for debate. What do we in the United States need going forward in order to re not eliminate, but reduce our vulnerability? And there's, again, diversification of foreign sources, stockpiling, and domestic or joint production arrangements. And the areas of chips is one of the things, absolutely, we ought to be looking at. Thank you. I'm going to ask this last question and open it to anyone, any of our wonderful uh, presenters. Throughout history, when a rising power has challenged the presiding world power, more often than not, the result has been war. And in many cases, the wars have devastated all involved. How do we avoid what we have seen so often in history as we see increasing clashes between China in its quest for dominance and the U.S.? That is in many ways the great strategic question of our time. I would simply say the Chinese are rational. What we constantly want to be is sufficiently strong ourselves and organize with our partners and allies. So any Chinese leader who is tempted to do certain aggressive things that could lead to conflict will think twice because they'll realize the game is not worth the candle. And that's why exactly what we're talking about here today is so essential. And in the immediate future, I would think making sure that China, China is not tempted to move against Taiwan coercively ought to be a, be a priority for American foreign policy, not just what we declare, but what we do. We've got to close the gap between our declaratory policy and our ability to implement it. Mr. Shriver, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. Uh, Thucydides was a, a very smart person and, and put forward some very compelling arguments, but that was largely a world before nuclear weapons and largely a world before we built our system of, of alliances and partnerships. So this isn't really about the U.S. and China, per se. It's about China's revisionist aspirations and growing power uh, against a coalition of like-minded partners who want to preserve the free and open order. So I think the combination of deterrence through the strategic weapons we have and the coalition that we have that will ultimately push back against China uh, will, will be our best uh, protection against a conflict that nobody wants. Thank you, Ms. Roland. I'm sorry I didn't get to you, but my time has expired and I yield back. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize my colleague from California and welcome um, her to the subcommittee. Um, Ms. Kim, you're recognized for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Chairman Barra and Ranking Member Shabbat. I, I appreciate your leadership, and it's a pleasure to join you today for the first hearing of the Asia Subcommittee. And welcome, distinguished uh, panel of witnesses. And I'm really excited to be able to serve as a vice ranking member of this subcommittee, and I look forward to working with all of you in this position moving forward. Um, I'd like to start my remarks today by recognizing the horrific events that have taken place in Myanmar over the past month. The actions taken by the Tagma Da in overthrowing the democratically elected government and cracking down on peaceful protesters and killing dozens, if not hundreds, of its own people in the streets, it's deplorable, it's horrific, and it's wrong. The, dec uh, the leaders of Myanmar made a commitment to uphold democratic principles over a decade ago. And the United States will not tolerate the oppression and killing of the freedom-loving people of Myanmar. And I call on our administration to immediately work with our partners in Asia to form a united multilateral front to pressure the Tamado to step aside and accept the results of this election from last year. So for my first question, I'd like to turn to Philippines and the, the hardships of facing landowners and farmers there as the government allows or participates in stealing land from its own citizens for larger corporations or government use. Many of my own constituents with ties to the Philippines have watched as their family lost their lands and livelihoods against their will at the hands of the government and big businesses. So I'd like to pose this question to Mr. Schreiber. Given your experience dealing with the Philippines, um, could you explain why this issue continues to persist and what the United States is doing to resolve it? Well, our alliance has always been somewhat hindered by 
the fact that the, the Filipino people have not had the good governance and, and quality governments that they deserve. There's certainly a history of corruption. There's a, certainly a history of elitism that uh, results in, in, in unfavorable government policies to the, to the people. Um, there's now the issue of extrajudicial killings related to the drug war. So we have an important relationship with the Philippines. It's an important ally, and I don't think we should uh, curb our engagement, particularly on the military and security side, because there are important things happening in that region. But certainly as a friend of the Philippines and, and the history that we have there and what we've done uh, side by side, um, we have to be encouraging the Philippines for a more representative government and a more uh, enlightened approach to, to these various issues. Otherwise, our, our, our partner will be uh, diminished and left behind. Well, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to turn your attention to Cambodia. As you know, Prime Minister Hun Sen has ruled Cambodia for decades as the sole source of centralized power. In 2017, he further cemented that power by outlawing opposition parties from participating in the nation's parliament and ensuring one-party rule. Kem Soka, who I had the pleasure of meeting, the leader of He's the opposition uh, Cambodian National Ruling Party leader. He was then arrested on attempts of seeking to overthrow the government and charged further with conspiracy with foreign powers last year as he awaits a trial for treason. So, Mr. Shriver, could you comment on the current safety of Mr. Soka and what options are available to Congress and the administration to have him released from the prison and democratic representation reinstated in Cambodia? Well, thank you for the question. Um, Kem Soka is a important figure in, in Cambodia, and certainly his efforts to promote uh, a democratic future by participating in the elections, despite the flaws in the in the electoral system and the fact that Hun Sen was never going to cede power no matter the, the outcomes. Um, so it's important that he be uh, uh, given the opportunity, not only for his freedom, but to continue to be active in the political space. I do check in on his condition every once in a while. Um, uh, you probably know his, he has family members in Washington, D.C. who are active on Capitol Hill and with the administration. His conditions have gone from house arrest to prison and, and different a variety of, of ways of holding him. And I think the important thing is we continue to pressure the government in Phnom Penh to not only release him, but allow him to uh, participate in the politics of Cambodia because it's, it's so important for the future of the people there. Thank you. I do have uh, further questions, but I'd like to submit that for a record, if I may, and uh, my time's up, so I yield back. Great, thank Great. you. And I don't think, I think all, all the members have had a chance to, to ask questions, but I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative just because we have this, um, wealth of expertise in, in, in front of us, and certainly we'll extend the, the same to the ranking member in his cl closing remarks um, to just a ask a couple follow-up questions on, on issues that, that we've touched on, but, but also that we may further want to explore. And you know, Dr. Haas, I'll also reach out to, to the council. Um, you know, one area you know, that the ranking member I talked about was obviously our failure to get the Trans-Pacific Partnership across the finish line and the, the, the strategic loss uh, of not having that rules-based agreement in place. So we'll reach out to the council and others to think about you know, understanding our own domestic politics and, and, and challenges, how we might consider you know, um, pushing, whether it's joining CPTPP or if some other multilateral agreement, but you know, certainly not having a multilateral agreement in place you know, leaves us vulnerable to, to Chinese influence. But two questions that, that I have, if um, the, the witnesses are, are willing to indulge, you know, we've alluded to the multilateral um, coalition and, you know, over the, the past 12 months with the pandemic, have had multiple conversations with our um, European allies and parliamentarians um, in, in how we how we approach the region. And, you know, if, if any of the witnesses could, could comment on how we, marry an Indo-Pacific strategy with our transatlantic strategy. I think that's something we didn't do well in the post-World War II environment, but certainly in this new world, you know, talking to our allies in, in Germany and, and, and elsewhere, I think it, it is in um, 
our interest to 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 create that partnership. And then a, a second piece that you know um, perhaps Ms. Roland, but you know certainly would open up to 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 any of the panelists. You know, my last travel to the region pre-pandemic you know, included visiting both Sri Lanka and Nepal. And part of the intent um, in those two countries was we had MCC compacts that were approved. That, that were there um, to help build the infrastructure, to help the hydroelectric um, projects in, in Nepal that would be to the benefit of, of the, this young democracy. They're both got enmeshed in domestic politic, political issues there. And you know, it's, I think it's my understanding that um, neither one got across the finish line. And as we think about you know, aid and development, countering Belt and Road, you know, it does occur to me that we also, you know, my intuition was that domestically there probably was Chinese influence in turning the public against some of these um, what again I thought were incredibly good projects that would help both Sri Lanka and um, so how we might think about the influence battle as well and you know how we how we counter that so you know I'll, I'll turn it over maybe to Dr. Haas um, and then Ms. Roland and then um, Mr. Schreiber. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, by the way, 10 seconds on uh, CPTPP. One way to expand, I think, domestic support in this country for entry could be if we introduced a serious climate component. So it didn't just make economic and strategic sense. But for example, if you if you try to modify the agreement, so certain types of goods either had advantages or disadvantages in trying to enter based upon their use, their how much carbon and so forth they were associated with, that might be something to change the debate in this country, just saying. In terms of transatlantic, it's important. Uh, we saw with the separate EU-China investment agreement, if we don't coordinate with the Europeans, we could pay a price for it. We could lose leverage vis-a-vis -vis China. So your meetings with parliamentarians are actually a really good idea. We should talk about things like coordinating sanctions and responses to Taiwan contingencies. There's more we could and should be doing on Hong Kong and on, on, on other human rights violations like the Uyghurs, agreement on technology uh, transfer restrictions, and on something like 5G. One of the lessons we should have learned, as Will Rogers might have said, if you had invited him here today, you can't beat something with nothing. So the United States and Europe are natural technology partners. Maybe it's in 6G or other things. And that ought to be part of the conversation I would think you and your colleagues would have. Ms. Rollins. Thank you, sir. As on, on the European side, being a European myself, I have to say something about that. I think uh, the time is really right. Um, and again, I think European powers are more and more um, willing to look into the Indo-Pacific region. Many of them have their own Indo-Pacific strategies set in place. That include not just the military and security component, but also other dimensions uh, that I think align very well with the American interests. Of course, Europeans being Europeans, they will always want to uh, retain a degree of strategic autonomy and not necessarily be always aligned uh, with Washington, D.C. However, I think convergence of interest and convergence of values are really important. Um, and are going to lead to greater uh, cooperation in, in all of these domains um, confronting the China challenge. Um, regarding the, uh, your, your experience with Nepal and Sri Lanka, I, 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 I thank you for sharing this experience. And I think this is a great example of where actually uh, BRI is, again, more of a a uh, grand strategy that looks into various domains. Influence operation is extremely an, an extremely important component of them, um, including the co-optation of local elites, which in the long term uh, influence political uh, decisions. And so um, if the U.S. wants to uh, provide alternatives to some of these projects, it cannot just be in terms of contracts and you know sustainable um, projects that we can offer that the US can offer but also working uh, more broadly uh, with different constituencies in the in those countries uh, improving good governance uh, making sure that 
uh, again, the governments of uh, countries where China wants to expand its influence are very much aware of the consequences it might have for their national interests in the long term as well. So there's, it's a comprehensive uh, objective, I believe. Great. Mr. Schreiber. Well, I, I endorse those answers. I, I would just add on the uh, EU point, um, since I came from the Defense Department, when it comes to actual hard power, um, there's really so, some some countries are more important than others. And I think we need to look at uh, enhancing our cooperation with the French, for example, who have four deployed forces in the Pacific region, given their Pacific holdings. They have uh, frigates in New Caledonia and the personnel station there. So uh, working with them, working with the Brits on the on the uh, sanctions enforcement uh, directed at North Korea, uh, people who can bring hard power are part of this equation as well, but it's a little bit more limited than than you'll find in the other areas of cooperation. Great. Thank you. And again, want to thank the witnesses. Let me offer the same courtesy to the, the ranking member. If there are any closing questions or clarifications and, and any closing comments that you'd like to make. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This panel did such a great job uh, in their presentations and answering the questions. Uh, that I'm not going to toss them any more questions. Also, we have our last vote of the day, the week, and this session uh, coming up here any minute now, so I don't want to drag it out. But uh, really, all three were excellent, so I again commend you, Mr. Chairman, and staffs on both sides for working this out with these witnesses. I hope that we can see them on future panels, uh, which I'm quite sure we probably will, um, because they really have been great. So, so thank you very much. Hope you all have a, a great uh, weekend, and you're always welcome to come to Cincinnati, uh, the greatest city in the United States at any time. So I just happen to represent it. So anyway, y'all take care. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Um, want to thank the the ranking member, um, Mr. Shabbat. Um, want to thank our witnesses and and who participated in this very important virtual hearing. And my staff is saying, um, with without objection. Um, all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous materials, and questions for the record subject to the length limitation in the rules. And again, look forward to working with each of the witnesses as, the, as well as the members of the, the subcommittee to address these major issues. And with that, a virtual bang of the gang, gavel and um, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>